Well, it is 5.30 and we have uh, quite a few people in the room. I'm sure some people will join us later, but I'm going to kick it off to respect people's time. And since we have a lot to talk about, I want to welcome everybody to this panel, Charting a New Path for Economic Recovery and Racial Justice Through Worker Ownership. I am Allison Powers, the Manager of Cooperative and Community Initiatives at Capital Impact Partners, and I'm joined by Todd Leverett from Dowie and Apis and Heritage, and Camille Kerr and Adrena Bryant from Chai Fresh. Uh, the flow today is that we're all going to introduce our organization or our project, and then we'll have a moderated discussion followed by Q&A. So if you all just have questions along the way and want to put them to the chat, I can elevate them towards the end of the session. So first, I'm just going to introduce myself and my organization. As I said before, I'm Allison Powers from Capital Impact Partners. This is the vision and mission of our organization. We are focused on engaging communities and increasing equity and opportunity. We are a CDFI, or Community Development Financial Institution, dedicated to delivering responsible, affordable lending to historically marginalized communities. These are our strategic pillars, addressing systemic poverty, creating equity, building healthy communities, and promoting inclusive growth. This is the lens that we do our work through. And like most CDFIs, we do a lot more than financing. We also have programmatic work, policy. Uh, we do have a impact note, which allows retail and institutional investors to get involved in our work. And on our website, you can find the prospectus pricing and more information. I can put the link to that in the chat. You can also ping Jessel Amin, who's at our at SOCAP conference this week to find out more about that note. Uh, as you can see, our we have a lot of focuses, including healthcare, education, affordable housing, healthy food, and of course, cooperative development, which we're going to talk about today. Um, Capital Impact has lent over $2.7 billion since our inception. $305 million of that has been in cooperative development. Co-ops have always been part of our focus or DNA since we started as part of the National Cooperative Bank. And we've really been looking at how the model can increase racial equity and be a catalyst to wealth creation, which is really what we're going to talk about tonight through the lens of worker cooperatives and employee-owned businesses. Uh, I did want to mention before I turn it over to my colleagues, the Co-op Innovation Award, which is funding that we provide uh, because we are larger national lenders, we can't always do some of the smaller projects that we did in the past. And so we like to put some funding towards ecosystem development and really want to encourage cooperative growth and development and communities of color. We really look at this as a way to amplify projects that are culturally relevant, led by community, and look at ourselves as a partner and hopefully a validator for some of these projects that are in their earlier stages. Uh, as you can see here, we have given out, out $400,000 over the past five years. That's been leveraged to secure more than $3.5 million in additional funding. And we have uh, our folks here tonight have received the award in the past. Dowie um, has actually received it twice and has that's been some of the seed funding for some of the conversion work. And Chai Fresh was one of our recipients in 2020 to help launch their startup. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn it over to my partner, Todd Leverett, who is going to chat about Apis and Heritage. Let me stop Thank you. screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Okay, cool. Can you see my, uh, you know, my presentations in the screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, Allison, thank you so much for, for the wonderful intro. Um, everyone is Allison the same. My name is Todd Leverett. I'm a program manager at the Democracy at Work Institute, which is a national 501 school that's focused on using um, employee ownership of democratic employee ownership 
as a, a racial equity tool and as a social equity tool with a focus on using the, the worker co-op model of employee ownership. I'm also co-principal at Apes and Heritage Capital Partners, and we're an impact um, investing firm that is incubated, that has been incubated by the Market at Work Institute, and we look to, to leverage impact capital to help convert closely held, privately held businesses over to employee-owned businesses with a focus on those businesses that have workforces of color and immigrant workforces. So we're throwing efforts, you know, we like to help black and brown workers buy their jobs. Um, and, and so before I jump in, I, I'll start off by, by, you know, while I have the soapbox saying that uh, America for me today feels feels a lot like the late in a game of Monopoly for those of you who grew up in the war era. Um, a few folks are all the houses and hotels and the railroads, mm -hmm. and everybody else is going around working our butts off, trying to get past go and try to pay the rising rent. Todd, you just got muted. I don't know how. Can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Yeah, so so briefly, I was saying that today's economy feels a lot like the game, a game of Monopoly, where some folks are really controlling on most of the board, and and everybody is, is left trying to catch up and paying rise in rents and utilities. I mean, if you're a person of, of color, if you're an immigrant in this nation, then you you know you may barely have a piece on the board. The the average black family in this country has you know one tenth the wealth of the average white, family, and over sixty percent of black have zero dollar in retirement assets, and, and seventy five percent of Latinx workers have zero dollars in retirement assets. So so you know what employee ownership does, and what we believe, and what we've seen employee ownership do, is is shift that dynamic and turn it on its head. And, and shift it away from 1% owning 50% of the board or 10% owning 80% of the board. And it creates an environment, uh, an entrepreneurial and ownership environment that's actually fair. And that may actually even be, be enjoyable, be fun. Um, and it, it's this shift that we at the Democracy at Work Institute and Apes and Heritage and Allison, Mill, and all these teams are working on every day. Um, and, and as we often say at Apes and Heritage, this is our reimagining of ownership and entrepreneurship. Um, in this country. So um, I'll go ahead and clip up the, the briefly, the form of employee ownership that our team at, at APIS and Heritage looks to lever um, through an impact fund is called is called the ESA operative model, which is which is kind of a, a new term, but essentially what it means, it's a it's a combination of the legal and tax benefits of an employee stock ownership plan at ESOP and the cultural and quality benefits of a of a worker co-op. Um, I won't go into all the detail, but briefly, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with ESOP, um, which is the most you know, standard form of employee ownership in the United States, um, ESOPs have been in federal legislation for almost 50 years. There are over 6,000 ESOPs in the U.S., and a lot of, and a lot of people don't know this, but um, ESOPs, 100% ESOPs pay zero, and most of the time, zero dollars in state um, corporate income tax, which is a huge benefit that can that can do a lot if directed in the right in the right places. Um, but ESOPs aren't just just advantage. Uh, the research shows they also outperform their their peers. Um, they grow faster, they increase profitability more, and they increase productivity, um, productivity of the firm and the is more than their peer firms. Um, so so you know, going back and looking at what happened during our last recession, employee-owned firms were significantly less likely to lay off workers, and they were significantly less likely to shutter and shut down. And even if you look at time periods where there's not a recession going on, these ESOP uh, employee-owned firms default significantly less on their debt than do their, their peers. So in short, ESOPs are just a better way, they're just better ways to do business. Uh, Employee-owned businesses, we believe, are just better ways to do business, whether it's a co-op or ESOP or, or another form. Um, but for us, just as important as ESOPs being better businesses, they're better for the workers. Um, as I stated before, 60% and 65% of Latinx workers have zero retirement assets. The, the average worker in ESOPs across the U.S. has over $120,000 in retirement uh, assets in their ESOP account, just in their ESOP account, which doesn't include any non-ESOP uh, other retirement accounts such as their 401k. Um, and so our investment model, we look for, you know, firms that are doing, you know, somewhere between one and $4 million in EBITDA, 
30 or more workers. We look to invest in these firms for five to six years, and we look to accelerate the wealth buildup by the workforces of color and provide each worker with between, you know, thirty to seventy thousand dollars of of ESOP value by the time we leave leave the firm, which is which is uh, significant. So, again, in short, you know, essentially how we invest, we utilize senior debt, uh, a seller's note, and our our product, which is an A and A structured equity mezzanine product that allows us to recapitalize small and medium sized firms to be a hundred percent employee owned without over leveraging the business, which is which is extremely important, as we all know. Um, you know, on this slide, we have a couple of example transactions um, that, that represent over 120 workers of color, immigrant workers, and, you know, over 140 workers generally, whose lives would be incredibly drastically different under our model. And these are two, you know, real opportunities. Names have been changed, but that, that, is in our, that are in our opportunity pipeline right now. Um, you know, so the last thing I'll say is that is that um, you know we don't just believe, and the research doesn't support the idea that just sharing financial ownership of firms produces all the growth and productivity benefits of employership. We believe in real ownership and real entrepreneurship for these workforces, um, and we're talking about aligning interests, the opportunities, and the risks of the firm with the interests, opportunities, and risks of the workforce. So, in our firms, we look for ways how can we actually have worker voice in the governance of, of the firm? Where does it make sense to have worker voice in, in management operations of the firm? How can we really create ownership? Open book management, human-centered HR, all, you know, uh, all these things that really change the, the, the culture of a firm. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say, you know, COVID has really shed a light on the, the disproportionate amount of risk that workforces, especially workforces of color, um, in this country take on without any corresponding reward and and all of us on this panel today are really looking to better align the risks that that workers take um, to their their personal lives to their health with the rewards that they're able to reap as as employee owners so um, you know we have we have here's a, a leadership team that's my partner you know we have our, our execution partners democracy at work institute Rutgers SES ESOP strategy service provider which does great work and we're really looking to to make a difference so I'll, I'll end my there and go ahead and pass it over to uh, Camille and T. Oh, okay, Sharon, can you see it? All right, I'm Camille. And I'm Edwina. And we represent Shy Fresh Kitchen. So uh, you can see the team here. Shy Fresh Kitchen is a worker owned cooperative owned by uh, five formerly incarcerated folks. And I know you can see six people. I'll yell it so Cap can count well. So that sixth person, that's Naya. She's our chef consultant in the front. And we are a food service contractor. We just got started in the midst of the pandemic here. And we um, do prepared meals for. Um, institutions that provide like schools or nursing homes and others that provide daily meals and our um, initial uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about our initial contract in a minute but uh, yeah we're we're collectively owned and governed um, by these these fine folks you see in the picture here um, let's see um, so I just put this just so you can see our mission and who you who we are and what we're doing so we're we're centering the needs, the wisdom, and the power of formerly incarcerated, primarily black women. And in the process, uh, we're creating something um, beautiful and also investable and also like um, something that we can that we can build on. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background about our what what we're trying to accomplish, our um, our areas of impact. So first, uh, first and foremost, we're providing economic security for our worker owners. Um, so um, right now, that uh, we can we can show you what that looks like. But we're also increasing healthy food access in low wage communities by um, serving food to folks who are um, who have food insecurity. We're raising the pro this part of um, our work in the the wonderful support that we've gotten from capital impact partners we're able to raise the profile of cooperatives as an approach uh to racial and economic justice that's 
um, through conferences like this, but also through press and other means. And then um, we are we're working with partners here in Chicago, not just to you know provide individual meals or to support our individual members, but to set this stage for a completely new uh, food system and economic system um, that's that's equitable, racially just, um, and so that's that's part of our larger mission. So you want to uh, what do you want to talk about? What we've gotten to to date. So we've gotten, <laughs> oh, you can't okay. see right now. <laughs> so since May 11, Chef Fresh Kitchen has provided living wages and benefits for five worker owners. Um, we served over 30, uh, 35,000 nutrition meals. Um, we partnered with 22 clients, been featured in 10 news stories. We have, <laughs> um, and we're, we're participated in two movement um, collaborators. Yeah, we're moving. One of them is a uh, collaborative for um, uh, to make a more just uh, Chicago th with we're partnering with BYP 100 and other movement actors. And the other one, like I mentioned, is about um, creating a more just food system here locally. Mm -hmm. um, and then the only thing I wanted to mention before we get to questions from Allison is that we are moving and we are growing so um, fast. So we are, um, we just got started in the midst of the pandemic. And so we, we registered in March. We did our first ma meal. Yeah, I think uh, we did our test meals in April, our mm -hmm. first real meals on May 11th um, mm -hmm. of this year. But we're buying our own building this year, um, yeah. and we're in the process. We just um, we just took a step forward on that today. And one of the reasons that we're able to grow and um, so quickly is we have a partner in Boston. Um, some of you all might know them. They're a social enterprise called City Fresh Foods, mm -hmm. and they have a hundred plus employees, and um, they are. Uh, you know, over 10 million, 15, close to 50 million in revenue, and they have been providing uh, support on how we do their same business model, which is to provide food to, um, to they do work with Meals on Wheels, with MCA, with a bunch of charter schools, how to do that here in Chicago. So they've been supporting us to do that. Since day one. Since day one, they've been helping us. So that's a little bit about us, and we'll get more into it with, uh, with your questions, Allison. And, um, there were some clarifying questions while you guys were talking, so I'll just throw those out fast and then we'll get into the discussion. I want to say the chat's been really active and there's other people in the employee ownership space that are listening to the session on the chat. So, you know, throw stuff out there if it comes, um, if something pops into your head. This one was directed towards Todd. Could this fund be brought into worker ownership to include gig and contract workers? That, that's a great question, Allison. And, and um, the answer in short is, and again, there are different forms of employee ownership, different strategies. The strategy that, that APIS and Heritage is doing as a project is specifically on closely held, privately held companies and converting them over, basically an employee buyout. But employee ownership is probably utilized even more when you're looking at you know, either small startup enterprises or looking for way for 1099 workforces, gig work workforces, workforce without a lot of of different protections to actually aggregate their power and come together and actually provide provide their services. So, you know, speaking specifically at Dowie, you know, our project is one of several projects. There's a project that's that's a lot more connected to what you're talking about, Git Workers, called the the RRC Rapid Response Co-op, that look mm -hmm. real with who are who are in the ten world and don't have all the the protections. Um, you know, your typical W-2 workforce, which are getting smaller. You know, your W-2 workforce is getting smaller and your, your gig workforce is getting a lot bigger. So that's a great question. Great. Just to add really briefly, so one of the, another initiative not related to Shy Fresh that's going on in California is that uh, there's um, a cooperative, we're working on um, a bill called the Cooperative Economy Act that would, that would be a new way to structure the gig economy creating cooperatives of gig workers that would then contract with platform companies. So uh, you can check that out at cooperativeeconomyact.org is another uh, 
another if you're interested in that specific um, model. And there was another clarifying question, Todd, that the companies you mentioned are 100 percent employee owned. Well, the, the two examples we gave are, are currently privately held by a single individual, small family. But our investment model would use our structured equity mezzanine capital to convert them over to 100 percent employee owned. But, but there, there, are, there are many, many 100% employee-owned uh, uh, companies in the, in the U.S., with the, the largest being Public Supermarket, which is actually 80% um, employee-owned, but they have like 200,000 employees. So it's, a, it's definitely a scalable model. Great. So I'm going to throw a question out to our panelists. How is your business model using co-ops to meet the needs or address the problems in your community? Um, I'll, I'll go and uh, briefly kick us off, and, I, and we touched on it. We touched on it in the presentation. Um, you know, really, the the main trend that this model was developed to to address was the was the racial wealth gap. Average white family seven to ten times the wealth of the average black and, and Latinx family. Sixty percent, seventy five percent black and Latinx workers. You know, I said it before. Environment, and, and as we all know, you know. What this lack of assets means is really a, a lack of a lack of well, a lack of opportunity, um, educational opportunity, entrepreneurial opportunity, ability to, to take risks to kind of really better your life and your family's life. Um, but it also is, is a lack of resilience, the, the inability to to withstand a medical emergency or, as you know, as stated before, a global a global pandemic. And it's you know it, it leaves black the, the communities uh, that need this the most. Um, it's, it's the reason why situations like this really, really create so many issues and so many problems. And we just, you know, COVID has really helped close that. All, all that to say, this is our model for how you can move wealth into these communities um, in, uh, in a way that makes sense, in a way, way that's scalable, but also how you can create quality jobs. Because we have a whole other issue in this company, uh, country with, uh, with working poor, with jobs that are providing protections. Um, and insurance and, and benefits the workforce. This is a way to address that problem. Again, that uh, community of color a lot harder than it hits uh, a community. Great. And for us too, we're, I mean, we were formed to, to deal with the fact that formerly incarcerated folks have a really hard time finding steady employment with good um, benefits and um, so we're like well let's create a workforce where we own it we know we're going to pay ourselves well we know we're going to treat ourselves well that type of um, also so that we can um, help other women who was informed who I have, have been incarcerated because as women all know what it feels like to come home and be turned down from so many jobs and it, you know, it's sad but it just happens in our community every day where you come, you served your time and did your time, and now you're trying to, you know, you're supposed to be really really patient. You want to do jobs, and you just told no, no, no. So we to come up with a plan where we can help women that we left behind and other women who came out to make sure that they do have somewhere where they won't be turned around and that they can build into and um, own their own business as well as they did. And then on the other side of our impact, we're also working to address the food insecurity in our communities because there's, you know, during the pandemic, there, there's always um, in many of our communities a lack of access to, to nutritious food and just access to food security in general. Mm -hmm. But the pandemic has made that so much worse. And so the other aspect of how we're serving our community is by providing um, meals. Most of our meals right now are specifically to address food insecurity. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Um, and you, you've been touching this on this a bit, but um, you know, how has the current health crisis, the pandemic, coupled with the economic crisis, changed your strategy, goals, and/or opportunities? So uh, it changed us. So we had a plan. Our plan was to target more like schools and um, nursing homes and things like that. When, with the pandemic, you know, here we were like, you know, 
is we gonna be able to go through because of COVID came during the time it was really going to, you know, going into business, we wanted to open up. Um, it haven't been a struggle, it really was a blessing more than a struggle for us because the pandemic like opened so many doors where we thought was just gonna be closed and we were shocked like it opened so many doors. We went from making 50 meals in our communities and serving to making um, 100 meals a day now. And that was like, we went from 50 to like 200 in a week. And then we just keep moving up, keep moving up. So for us, the pandemic, yeah, the pandemic has just been a blessing where we didn't expect it to go as well as it did. Um, but we do still have those models where that is the you know, to target schools. Cause like most of us have children. I have a ton of homes in school who never eat school food. So we wanted to also put, you know, uh, healthy food and fresh food in our communities where some kids at home only eat a meal at school, right? And we wanted to make sure that those kids would eat those meals at school where it's good, it's fresh, and it's still healthy. Because you can have fun food for kids that they will eat that's healthy. So uh, we still plan on going that route, but in the pandemic we have, we get so many comments and blessings, like so many people pop us when we wear our shirts just to say like, we served them that we didn't even know that we were serving, but they stopped and get those meals. So the pandemic has been a blessing for Chef Fresh. Yeah, and I mean we know it's it's hurt so many. And what what we're what we've been able to do is that there's a lot of funding out there to address the food insecurity that has been happening during the pandemic. And so we've been able to um, leverage the funding that's coming in uh, to to address that. Um, and be the be one of the major contractors um, that's that's uh, that's providing food to the south and west sides right now. And people are really uh, commenting on your your growth and project in the chat. So just just elevating that support. <laughs> um, and there's actually also been several questions in the in the chat about what's the role of capital in your projects. And what are some of the barriers you face, strategies you, you've adopted, if you can talk a little bit more about investment and in capital? There's been a, a few people wondering about that. Yeah, well, I, I guess I can, I can start with this question. So um, and I can address a, a few questions that are going out um, in the chat. You know, from, from the outside, our, you know, the way our firm is structured looks a lot like your a typical private, private equity, you know, private debt, mezzanine debt type of type of firm. So we did that. And somebody talked about this in, in the chat. We wanted to create a, an investment model that was familiar, um, that was familiar to the to the, the broader investment world. Uh, partly because we want to see this model scale up. We want to see you know one, two, three funds down the line. You know, Calpers being able to invest in this model and creating employee ownership or university endowment or you know large institutional investors being able to invest in this. So we're we're structured like a typical, you know, essentially mez mez debt fund. Um and so um you know that that being said the, the investment that we look to that we look to do that we look to make is is a is a you know mezzanine product um mezzanine slash structured equity product. So you know these are private equity transactions. These are large larger deals, larger transactions. So you know, we need a large pool of capital to be able to, to make this happen. So that's kind of the role of capital. One step back to kind of the, the COVID question. Um, I just want to say, you know, there was a, a you know, pre-COVID and post-COVID life. And and as this relates to the financing, pre-COVID, our plan was to go out and kind of do independent sponsor deal by deal sort of model. But for post-COVID, uh, a lot of the, the potential, you know, investors, the LPs we were talking to said, hey, I, I think, you know, I think there may be an appetite to go out and do in the larger, the larger investment vehicle, the larger fund. And we've actually had, you know, really good reception from the broader investment community about being able to, to invest in, you know, first time fund managers doing a model that really helps help their community move the community forward. So. Thanks so much. Um, do we want to talk, you want us to talk about investment a little bit? Yeah. That's yeah. So the, the so we're so um I'll, I'll two two birds here because we got asked as well is how we set up our co-op. So we are um 
We are registered as a limited worker cooperative association in Illinois, which is a new form. It's kind of like a combo between a co-op corporation and an LLC. And we we passed a law. We helped pass a law that created that, and then we registered under it. Um, so the way that we take in, so we basically have two classes of shares. We're um, we have one class of voting shares that comes to membership shares, um, 100 100% owned by the worker owners. Um, those are the only voting shares. And then we have preferred shares that provide a target dividend. Um, uh, our, in our, right now we're a collective. So everyone who's a member is an owner is, uh, or is a director. Um, we make all decisions, they make, they make all the decisions, uh, collectively. Um, and so in terms of investment, so I personally invested, um, a little bit up front. Um, and then we got some grants, including the wonderful grant from Capital Impact Partners, our first grant, the one that really let us uh, get started and, and get up on our feet. And then um, in terms of actual investment, the first um, in, uh, first act uh, investors besides me um, will hopefully come in as we build, buy our building. So we are currently um, in the process of purchasing a building and we are using both debt and equity capital. Basically, the way that it breaks down is we're using debt for the, the acquisition of the building, and then we're using equity to build it out. Um, and we are blessed to be to be working with folks in the cooperative community and folks in the in this kind of social impact community on some of that money. So capital, in, um, sorry, so shared capital cooperative. Um, a cooperative that's it's it's actually structured as a cooperative and it only funds cooperatives um, they've um they're providing our loan capital and they're actually um possibly looking at providing they're building a new equity product based um that's that's focused on um bridging the racial uh wealth gap that they might provide some equity with as well so they're providing our um, loan capital for this building purchase. And then we're um, working with a couple of different folks in the impact investment community on a possible um, on a possible equity investment around $250,000. And that one would be structured basically as a, as a dividend, a preferred dividend with a little bit of upside, like a range of dividend rates between five and 8%, something in this range. Um, and our loan capital is closer to between six and seven. Can I ask what has been your, when you've gone out to look for, for debt or gone, you know, gotten meetings with investors, what has been the reaction? Like, how do people respond to the concept of employer worker ownership? And do you think that folks kind of understand or are excited about the model? We went to friends. So our friends are very, about the model. I mean, Christina Jennings and Mark Dick and people I've been working with for a good decade now. And so, yes, they are very enthusiastic about the model. And then, um, you know, we're talking to Morgan Simon, we're talking to Brendan Martin and his team over at the working world. So we kind of went inside uh, our um our community. So uh, we, we haven't had to sell co-op. I guess what I'll say is we haven't had to sell the cooperative model to anyone. Everyone we're talking to is already. Yeah, that's actually we're on the opposite end. We're, we're talking to, to, to people who this is a new idea, new concept to, to a lot of a lot of years. But what I really love about it is it, it makes intuitive sense in a lot in a lot of ways. The idea of the alignment of incentives of you know the company and workforce and, and it makes sense to a lot of folks most of the questions are around kind of me mechanics of how you know really the ESOP model works it's, it's a really heavy heavily regulated uh, model but what we always say is that that actually works in in our favor like there's no way we're able to overpay for a company because you know there are regulatory you know the department is just sitting there making sure that workers are not going to overpay for firms. So there's a lot of different checks and balances on the model that we have to explain, uh, that we have to explain to investors to kind of, to kind of get them to understand that, that it makes sense. Um, but but we, we had a pretty good, a pretty good reception to it. And, and I will say I'm surprised by how many people have had some kind of contact 
or spend a part of their life doing something co-op related. A lot of times work a co-op or co-op or produce a co-op. But, but the, the model has hit a lot of people in a lot of different ways in life. So it's always exciting when, when somebody's already familiar with it. Yeah, so many people are members of co-ops or credit unions, even if they don't know it. And speaking of questions about the model, there was a question in the chat about if you could speak a little bit more about the difference between an ESOP operative and a worker cooperative. And, you know, I know you mentioned it before, but kind of why that model is easier. Yeah. So, and, and I think the person who asked the question also touched on the fact we look at, we look at the ESOP from the perspective of, you know, you got this, this really long-standing, like really solid, like legal protections, regulatory protections around the model. Um, it's um, and you get that really significant tax benefit. So part of what we talk about when we're we're investing, you know, investors who are looking for 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 risk-adjusted returns, you know, this is a benefit that you can't get from any other type of investment in a company or a fund, which is the elimination of federal and state tax benefit. We really felt that it was important to, to take advantage of that tax benefit of these firms for the benefit of, of the workforce and for the benefit of, of the folks investing in the model. Really look at the as the kind of the legal structure, the tax structure of the business. And then the, the, the co-op model, which is based on these principles of worker participation, worker governance, um, you know, broader social responsibility and connection between other co-op or worker firms is really about the 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 culture, the ethos, the personality, and the values of firms, um, that, you know, that is also kind of our bread and butter in the bread and butter of Dow. And that's where we look at that as like the organizational cultural change we're going to make in the firm. So we kind of see them in different ways they, they play together. And, and just one more question from the chat, and I'll point this towards Chai Fresh. Um, Someone asked about the kind of co-op government governance structure and what are some of the barriers to that? And I'll, I'll also flip it on its head and say, what are some of the opportunities in that governance structure? Yeah, so Shy Fresh is completely a collective, um, which means that every member is an owner, every member is a is every member is a director, and there's no outside directors, so it's just um just the team <laughs> that's the only people just the worker owners are the only ones making decisions and let's see what are the challenges and opportunities i mean like i feel like you know people are like you need outside directors you need outside people who can and and i mean in my experience we just we ask them for advice we have outside people they advise us they give it like city fresh like we're saying they give us a lot of advice they're just not they don't have a governance role right um, I don't know. Do you want to talk to any of the challenges in us making all the decisions? The challenges is, I'll just say, like, some of the challenges be, you know, sometimes it's just agreeing, right? I guess that's just, it's probably normal. Like, I might disagree, and then two or three more might agree with what the fourth, the fifth one is saying, right? So, but we just usually come up, you know, we think about it, we sleep on it, and majority vote, our votes the less, and that's just what it is. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's mostly, I don't know, we really ain't ready for a lot of challenges yet, but yeah. Yeah, and we, I mean, the majority, but we mostly do things by consensus. Like, we don't railroad, I mean, nobody's gotten railroaded, right? Like, I mean, I no, because. Like it's like if, if if more than three say, you know, sometimes some one person probably just don't see it that way. So if more than three say this, I agree, I agree. Is until I feel they're not gonna just be like, well, they they outed you because it was three more, but they, you know, we just break it down and we talk about it, we go back into the table, we go and see it, and then you know, until we all come up to with something that makes sense. Thanks so much and. Just to say that there's some co-ops that can look like Chai Fresh. That's pretty, you know, collective decision making, and and you know has a smaller group. And then there's some uh, employer-owned businesses or co-ops that can have kind of a traditional management structure. And you know, I'm sure some of the businesses Todd works with that might 
you know, run a certain way. It doesn't necessarily have to look one way. It can also be as long as you have one member and one vote, it's democratically owned. Um, there can be different models that the workers choose to work with. So that's kind of one of the beauties, beauty of the models. Just one, one thing about that scale thing is we have a provision in our governance and our bylaws that says that once we hit, I don't know if it's 15 members, that we, we consider moving to representative governance where we elect specific members. We could even do outside ones at that point if we wanted to, but there's like a, there's like a turning point that's, that's built into our model where if we get too big, then we switch over to at least consider, um, at least consider the uh, representative model. Okay. All right, well, um, my next question, and there's been a lot of comments in the chat about how, you know, knowledge of co-ops and employee-owned businesses have re has really grown so much in the past five, 10, 15 years, and that a lot of these support organizations technical assistance, financing organizations weren't available just a short time ago. So you have these, these resources um, for organizations like yours that are thinking about growth and scale. And so I wanna ask you all, um, what are the current opportunities in terms of, you know, what's your vision for a new economy that's based on a restorative social justice, hoping this movement you know, will grow and, and you can also include in that, you know, thinking about scale and replication and what this could look like five, 10, 15 years down the road. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kick that one off. I'll say briefly and talking to your point about how kind of there's been an enlightenment on an employee ownership over the past several several years. You know, I've been in this world from about, from about five or employee ownership world for about five years and it's been amazing. But, you know, I went to business school, never heard anything about employee ownership models, went to law school, never really, you know, these were never really presented as as kind of actual models that that should exist in a, in a larger scale in our economy. So, so I imagine a future where these principles that we're talking about is almost niche or, or revolutionary sorts of ways are part of the standard business education, part of the standard legal education that you know, your wealth managers, your your asset managers, your your bankers, this becomes part of the, the standard, you know, knowledge that's necessary for, for them to kind of progress in, in their careers and for them to do their jobs. And I think once it once it hits that that point, you'll start to see employee ownership really become a, a sector of our economy the way it is in, in a lot of other places in the world, a lot, lots of parts of Latin America and Europe, and it'll actually start to be a, a more robust, robust field. That, our personal vision, and this is kind of what we're doing, we're hoping through our model to, to de-risk this as an investment model for an investor. So we imagine, you know, not just a fund two or fund three, we imagine, you know, uh, this becoming a, a, a broadly used investment strategy for, you know, fund managers of the nation. Um, there's been information out recently about how Pete Stavros at KKR has actually been in implementing aspects of, of uh, you know shared employee ownership and i think push you know almost 500 million dollars or more out to employees through different option plans so it's, it's starting to catch on but i think we have a long way to go to where it can really help help shift the tide of wealth gap generally and and you know from our focus we really start to shift the tide of, of the racial wealth gap it's going to it's going to take more people we definitely need more people And I think part of what we're trying to achieve is just, I mean, part of this work in the new economy work is to just open people's imaginations to what's possible um, for a new system or the way that institutions can look on the other side. And um, I think that we're, we're just trying to model and be a visible example of what can be. And um, and us alongside, you know, APIS and Heritage, alongside a lot of the incredible, um, like, Boston Ujima projects and all of the, all the innovators that are, that are building new things and just saying, like, hey, like, this can be different. Um, and, and so I think part of the vision is just, like, we know, at least for me, it's not like, oh, 
one by one we can we can replace every existing type of, of business out there slowly you know i don't think that it would be that easy to slowly and surely replace our economy with cooperatives but what we can do is we can let people know that something else is possible so that when it's time to change major policies when it's time to change how our economic system is structured that they that we have a vision of what can be on the other side and um on a more like visceral level the vision that we have for folks i don't know if you want to talk about what, what we want to how we want to affect folks that are members um, yeah um, us yeah you <laughs> um we just all excited um we just we excited about the the, the video that's in front of us because like i said we come from we all work out the radio at one point and the fact that we even be on our own business i mean we talk about 30 years from now, we just talk about so much how big it can be, how many people in our neighborhood and in our community is that we can help, you know, with no funding jobs, how I can provide and help for our kids and their kids. Like, you, the stuff we talk about, it just be, we be so excited. We go into all these like visions of what we just can become, and we're just proud that we even here. Yeah. I'll, I'll add one thing. I, I, I mean, that's, I, I'll add one thing. Camille was kind of throwing out a, a list of some names, but just to give folks some more, more people to Google. So um, this is specifically kind of on the, in the fun world side, you know, we're doing this work. Look at the, the ICA group, the uh, jobs worth owning. Look at the working world. Look at the Evergreen Fund model in Cleveland. Look at Main Street Phoenix Project. So we're we're out there, and the numbers are growing every every day. Uh, again, specifically talking on the the fund side of the model, but but we're out there. But we definitely need more. And then on you know on the earlier stage company model, it's there are a lot of projects out there doing doing good, amazing work. Um, yeah, so yeah, there, there's there's folks out there. If you want to get connected to anybody else in the ecosystem, contact Allison, you know, me or me, we'll, we'll get in touch. I, I specifically mentioned Boston Ujima Project because it's a, a democratically community-owned capital that is owned by working class people of color in Boston. And like, to me, like, when we're, like, when we're trying to model, what they're trying to model, like these, you know, I think that we're looking at what the future can be because it's it's more it's when you center folks and their needs and their vision and their wisdom like we're coming up with like incredible like this 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 company is so much more like when when I was just like we could do something you know with formerly incarcerated people to provide economic security but what they created with just access to resources, just removing those barriers. What they created is so much more than I could have envisioned. Like who they are is like so much more than like just thinking through like what, what's pot. So I feel like these models that really center folks, center folks in, um, in the governance, in the ownership and, you know, just taking barriers away and what y'all create is like incredible. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll add that, you know, in this co-op innovation award that we've been doing for five years and we get over you know, 100 applications from all over the country with amazing projects. And what one trend that we've really seen is folks using this in all sorts of different ways in their community. So the model is flexible enough that it can work around what your specific needs are, whether that's a service, whether that's, you know, kind of culturally relevant, language relevant. I mean, it's it can be meet such a, a myriad of needs and that people are using it in such different ways and in in really kind of grassroots capacity. So it's great to see that grow because we had we had a comment in the chat of, you know, something about co cooperatives in Spain. And when you look at scale, and I know that there's a lot of international people at co-op at um at SOCAP, you can really see how this model can be scaled with the appropriate policy levers as it has in Spain and Italy and other countries around the, the world. Um, and we have a couple of more questions from the chat box. One was, can you talk more about the legal changes, local and national needed to enable 
the ESOP and cooperative model models. I'm not sure if it's legal or if it's policy. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. What the... So so I'll talk. Um, I'll talk briefly about some some good things that we have been seeing. So about two summers ago, federal government passed the first kind of uh, employee ownership related legislation that it had in a long time called the Main Street Ownership Act which basically encouraged the, the SBA to figure out, to do the work, to figure out how to properly underwrite employee-owned businesses, ESOP co-op, so that, you know, you know, these employee-owned businesses could start utilizing, you know, SBA products, including 7A loans to convert businesses and, and, and grow businesses. So there's some movement at the federal level. I'm sure a lot, and again, I'm talking, this is very US, US focused. Um, I'm sure all of you heard about some of the, or some of you heard about some of the legislation going out right now saying companies who are taking aid for COVID relief, um, you know, there's a suggestion that they should have to um, provide some level of um, ownership share with their workforces, um, not necessarily co-op, not necessarily ESOP, but these ideas of aligning risk and reward of, of workforces with with the, the wealth creating potential of companies are, are really starting to expand. So we're seeing there's going to be more legislation coming out at the federal level. We see a lot of uh, municipalities and a lot of states who are able to move more quickly, do some really good things out there. So, so there's there's good movement there, but more could be done. I would argue that it's, it's you know, almost more to get the, the, the capital class, the investing class, to really see the value um, first and you know, the way once the investing class is there, you know, government will eventually will eventually catch up. I mean, I guess for me, like eventually, I just I think it should not be okay to rent people's time to hire people. <laughs> that you should that everybody who is part of a business should own that business. I mean, eventually, what are the policy things that that um, I want to see is that is that you know democracy is not just a political institution, but an economic is part of our the, you know is woven into who we are economically as a as a society as well. So I mean, long, long term, short term, <laughs> because that's a that's a long ways away. That's not a that's not a this lifetime thing. So short term, I mean, if you have procurement um, preferences. Um, or even requirements for, like, if we could move into a social co-op model where, like, the, the bigger types of services that we all need, food production, energy, like, meet, like, our, our preference to be cooperatives or required to be cooperatives, that, I think that would be a really important step. Um, funding uh, these uh, these initiatives providing more funding to so that people can pilot and 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 try new things and and fail without risking their whole um, their whole lives. And I think stuff like that would be helpful as well. Um, there's there's a lot of potential policy that could support, but eventually, you know, hopefully, we can have a democratic economy. And. I'll add that there's just a lot of people getting together on a local level to advocate and and talk about these issues. I'm on. I know there's someone here from the DC Co-op Stakeholders Group that I'm on, and it's just a group of people who live in DC, and we all get together and we're trying to think about policy and we're trying to think about ways to to push these levers and 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 take advantage of of this time of economic crisis to think about what could be in 2021 and beyond, which leads to another question that somebody asked in the chat. Do you believe co-ops are becoming more popular because of COVID and current social justice, ra racial equity discussions and actions? If so, how can you see sustaining this in, long, in the long term? So I'll, I'll start and say, and say yes. Um, yes, yeah, I think that that your intuition is is right there. Um, in, into the the question of how do you sustain it, I I know in our mind that just you know I don't know what you call it. There's we feel there's there's a window of time. You know the mem the memory of the public tends to be short sometimes. So there's there's a window of time where people are still feeling, you know. And, I, and I'm speaking specifically on on some of the the, the racial justice issues are really 
focused on communities of color, empowering communities of color, protecting communities of color. And, you know, this happened and there are trends. So we think there's a, there's a period of time where the public is focused on, on wealth and communities of color and safety communities of color. And we're just trying to, while that time is still here, um, to, to take advantage of the moment and really get things moving. Um, COVID seems like it's going to be with us and the, and the, the impacts of COVID are going to be with us for, for a very long time. Um, and, and again, the vulnerability of workers, especially workers of color, especially essential workers, is going to be clear for a very, very long time. And so I think people recognizing that on a larger scale, people feeling that personally is, is definitely going to move this, this work forward. Yeah. And I'll just add that so inequality isn't, it's not getting better. I mean, our, 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 our work is to address social ills that are accelerating. And I can't imagine that without major policy changes, you know, reparations and other major policy changes that these are going to get better. So we are demonstrating we're just, I mean not only are we like using this moment we're also preparing for hopefully what could be a seismic shift in what our what our system look like eventually right I mean I think this inequality is so out of hand right now where the top one percent own some absurd amount of of our land and our wealth in this country um, and so I think that these solutions only become more and more pertinent as those accelerate. And, and I'll, I'll add one thing briefly. One thing that we have found is that there is, you know, some of you heard the silver tsunami, baby boomer business owners retiring, looking for ways to dispose of their assets and, and liquidate their assets and can't and not being able to find them. Um, that, that whole trend is accelerating in a very real way. And you have a lot of valuable commercial assets out there that are looking for a home that can't find a home. And you have owners who are aging and looking to exit and they can't exit. Um, and so there is a very real opportunity, you know, once in a generation opportunity where where the, the assets are looking for a place to go. And if we can catalyze the the people, the workers, the teams, and the capital to make it happen, we can we can we can do some really important work during this very difficult time. Great. Thank you all so much. I'll I'll throw in one more question from the chat, which is how does it work when you have these employee-owned, worker-owned companies and people leave? How does that impact the business and how do you kind of set up for, for sustainability? Uh, well, so just one thing that you, you just pay people out when they leave um, and uh, you make sure that you have policies that make it uh, financially viable for the company, but um, so I don't know if you want to talk about how we work. With. Um, so for us, when people, well, yeah, we just pay them out, but one of our policies is when you own um, IEM, right? Yeah. So to become, if somebody was to leave, um, so when we hire, they, after a certain amount of time, they're offered the opportunity to become members as well where we um, collect a small amount out of like $2,000 they have to pay to become a member, a work on member. So uh, that's how we bring people in. Right. And then we just pay them out if someone decided they just wanted to leave the business. Similar in the ESOP model, when, when people leave by, by law, you have a certain amount of, a certain amount of time um, over which you're, you know, you have to buy back the shares that represent their share of ownership in the business. So, you know, as a, you know, you manage the cash flow from the business, you, you, um, a way where you're able to, to make people are able to, to, um, make the business. Sometimes you, you refinance the cash amount, or sometimes you just have the cash on the, on the about piece. But there are, there are ways to manage that cash flow so that, um, people are able to really utilize the benefits that they have as a worker on it. Okay, great. Uh, thank everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. I want to thank our panelists, everyone that was so active in the chat. 
um, answering each other's que questions and and getting into a robust discussion. I want to encourage you, you know, between the folks that are on this panel, we know a lot of people in the, the co-op and worker ownership ecosystem. So we're happy to connect you with some of our friends and colleagues. Feel free to ping us on, you know, through SOCAP or LinkedIn or any of the, um, you know, the different tools that are out there. And we look forward to, um, you know, the growth in this model and all of the collective visions for the future. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.